Welcome to CAM Radio, an ahead of the curve initiative by Cyrilla Marchand Mangaldas, bringing you every Friday the latest in legal and policy. Stay tuned, enjoy listening. So, good morning and uh, welcome to our 14th event. We are doing something like this uh, after a long time post COVID. Good to be back in person. It's a completely different uh, feeling. Uh, and also, in terms of the subject that we have chosen for today, it's very contemporary. Uh, I hope it will be of uh, use to you. And uh, the way we structure it also is not like a lot of talking heads. I think it's going to be a uh, conversation. And whether you're on the panel or on the floor, uh, please feel free to make this a conversation. So the topic for the day really is about deal making uh, in a VUCA world. I think we experience it uh, every day. Uh, the term VUCA was coined for the first time in 1985 by two authors, uh, Warren Dennis and Bert Nanos, uh, in their uh, then famous book on leaders' strategies for taking charge. And thereafter, but when it really got prominence was when it started in 1987, when it started getting used by the U.S. Army, uh, and it sort of became part of some of the curriculum in the U.S. Army War College to describe the post uh, post uh, sort of World War World post War World uh, after the end of the Cold War when the Berlin Wall came down, and then the world that appeared uh, sort of after that. When we started really become it was I think from a geopolitics point of view, it was a completely different uh, ball game. And the world was sort of broadly divided into three blocks: the U.S. slash West, uh, Russia, and its allies, and then a third kind of block, call it the non-aligned uh, world or you know random players, sometimes backed by the U.S., sometimes backed by Russia as well. How all of that played out. But as we fast forward to today, we realize that that doesn't feel good anymore. Uh, yes, the world is still divided into blocks. It's much more multipolar. Uh, you have the US, China is the new Russia, you can say that. Uh, and also the relationship between China and Russia is a uh, topic for uh, a lot of discussion. But there are lots of other nuances around, you know, who's friends with who who is friends with both like we are uh, and uh, maybe not China but at least in terms of Russia certainly you have said brought a, a very interesting part. So the, uh, the algorithm for dealing uh, with geopolitics in the world has changed completely. So that is a, in some sense the source of uh, source of uncertainty in today's world or the VUCA world. To that on top of it you add uh, the internet. The internet is a relatively uh, new phenomenon, and in fact, we all know every minute of the day how it has changed our world completely. And after that, on top of that, social media and everything, uh, the world of artificial intelligence and stuff like that. So, the technology has again been a completely different dimension. We have just about come out of the pandemic, and we saw how that really turned our world. Uh, upside down, but also brought with it a lot of opportunity. For example, uh, video conferencing. We couldn't have even imagined uh, that it, it can become a prominent part of you know, how we conduct business as well. So, back to uh, in terms of the pace of constant change, uh, it, as they say, that change is the only real constant. There so many moving parts. Uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, the economist always comes up with an interesting uh, issue in the first quarter of, uh, of January. And they came up, one of their editors, Bhati B, uh, he came up with a very interesting uh, expression, uh, which I love. He combined two concepts of what he called the perma crisis and VUCA, and gave it a new expression called perma VUCA solution. Which is the world is in a permanent state of crisis, and on top of it, you add uh, add VUCA. I think we all know what VUCA is: volatile, uncertain, 
complex and uh, and ambiguous and we'll unpack each one of these uh, concepts so the current state of the business world is actually driven by this so why do i say so so first we then in zooming out in terms of what's on top of the mind of business leaders and even political leaders because the world is at war at least in two major geographies and in in this century we are not supposed to be at war uh, all that kind of came to an end uh, supposed to have come to an end at the when world war 2 was over but we still find it and we still find these wars which don't even have a predictable uh, end to it we don't know today how you bring situation to end and what implications does it have Putin was on the verge of pressing the nuclear button, uh, but was when global pressure held him off from there. You can imagine the catastrophic consequences of the attack. Gaza, uh, that thing used to uh, play out, and while these wars are very far away, uh, in today's connected world, it impacts us whichever corner of the world. We are because of integrated supply chains. Uh, and a lot of global factors are like interest rates uh, oil prices the impact can be felt on every corner of the world 50% of the world's population will go to elections in, in, in this year including us uh, i mean the two three biggest ones are uh, the us and uh, trump is looking more and more uh, real than before uh and we sort of a look at static as probably as from 2.0 uh um, the one thing about the indian situation is it doesn't look at uncertain it looks more just like continuum and as we stand today it looks like modi 3.0 uh is uh, these a very high chart it never take anything for granted the uk uk may technically be uh, cross part of 2025 but it's in this same continuum that you will see a lot of the world uh, economy and, and many of them will throw out their governments and and bring in new ones and a new set of policies and a new set of biases and a new set of attitudes as well so when half the world is uh, in that state of uh, almost like a democratic tantrum uh, at what at how do you predict what policy will be we are also um, i think this has probably been building up for a while i probably started in the early part of uh, trump 1.0 of whether we are in a deglobalizing world or a reglobalizing world uh, or should we be converging or should we be diverging uh, trump first called out uh, china as uh, china and some other economies as including for a moment india as well that as a uh, as nations who have misused uh, american generosity and therefore a lot of his policy including make america great again uh, and he going to continue that i think that but started that whole uh, deglobalization nationalism protectionism all of those uh, themes as well and on top of it in that the geopolitical tensions with uh, with china it changes the dynamic completely so China is really in trouble just now in their economy. They are looking at low growth. Uh, deals have slumped uh, dramatically. Uh, they have many problems. One of which is the uh, real estate. The whole real estate sector is around 500 billion worth of uh, worth of assets in trouble, and that has knock-on implications across the world. Now, thankfully for us, where we have positioned ourselves, both because of Uh, smart political thinking as well as luck uh, were well positioned in terms of how to take advantage of uh, the US China uh, divide and also looking at all the tailwinds that are there one of the things that we certainly have is political certainty uh, we have a strong leader whether you like him or hate him is a different topic but i think the fact that he brings uh, stability and predictability is something which most nations in the world are craving for so there are certain aspects of hookah that don't have like this which is we can know I mean, the joke goes that in america we know the exact date of the election but we don't know who's going to come out of the end of it india doesn't know the exact date of its election but we know who's going to come out of it so that's the difference between the two a uh, lot of it, uh, uh, also cross border regulatory changes as well including 
you know how our policy has evolved. We need to focus on here, but for example, something like that's not free. And in terms of how we translate it, essentially a geopolitical idea and move it into uh, the sort of ordinary day-to-day -day business and policy uh, framework. So that, just an example, the US has does it through CFIUS. Australia has their own version of uh, CFIUS as well. Europe has their own version as well. And we're kind of realizing that in a post-war world, uh, they became friends in Russia and they bought a lot of oil from Russia. But the family realized, hey, uh, you know, where did this dictator come from and what implications it has when you have essentially a democratic, uh, you know, aggregation of continental Europe. But on the one hand, you have an extreme autocrat who has a completely different uh, agenda as well and reconciling those two uh, forces are, is, is not easy. And you know, Germany, for example, is uh, more than 40% of their oil comes from Russia, so they can't act up either. Because then Putin just has to, to jump the tab and uh, Germany will freeze in winter. Other uncertainties, uh, climate risk, uh, and following that, climate uh, uh, litigation as well. I mean, look here in Delhi. Uh, more than half the year, I'm sorry, I'm not being offensive, but this is feel unlevable. That's right. Uh, this is probably one of the few months where you can actually uh, live here and breathe. And I was standing outside uh, and, and breathing the Delhi air, and that's quite a rare thing. Uh, we, we sit in Mumbai and read about AQI being 700 and 800, and wonder how you guys manage. It's a beautiful city. Uh, and I think really you know about this incident also when Prince Charles was here and uh, the big fan met Modi and it's a beautiful city Prime Minister, but how do you breathe in this city? Uh, and I think that set off a whole chain reaction, but nothing happened. Uh, I think you still, this is one of the big challenges that you have. I, I live in uh, Mumbai where every year the sea level rise and uh, municipal commissioner has publicly said that uh, by 2050, Narayanan Point will be underwater. Uh, as well. I don't know what that actually means. I, my house is on the uh, seafront and I don't know whether we, I might have gone, but my grandchildren whether they have to live in some kind of a houseboat or I don't know uh, of, uh, of how that's going to be. So this is, this is what we are facing. Climate litigation is building up uh, globally. Uh, we are seeing the first signs of that uh, in India as well. What you see is a lot of NGP litigation, basically climate related litigation. We have not yet seen massive court actions, but the framework exists. And if I were in a leadership position in a corporation doing business anywhere in the world, including India, which has a large environmental uh, footprint, I would very much worry about climate litigation coming out of somewhere. And, uh, and actually blowing a hole through the balance sheet. So, and I know that a lot of uh, business leaders do think about this. Then is generative AI, uh, which is posing essentially existential questions on, uh, on humanity, uh, on, on their ethics, on public policy, on the question between efficiency versus redundancy, including in my world as a professional service. We are going to be deeply affected. Or any profit, any knowledge based organization is going to be deeply affected. What is the shape of a firm? So, in the last 60 years, ever since from the Karachin invented it in uh, the post war world, where law firms are shaped like pyramids. So are consulting firms, so are accounting firms. And uh, then, after some time, after the rise of the outsourcing world, it started becoming okay, they actually shaped like a rocket. Uh, and now, what uh, is being sort of canvassed is that no, no, you're actually going to be shaped like a mushroom. Where you have a large base, a very thin middle, and uh, a topic of AI is going to replace the whole middle. And that is a frightening idea because how do we produce partners? We produce partners through the apprenticeship model, uh, where people grow, they learn from their seniors, they watch them at work. So when you impose a whole dose of uh, of AI to get a lot of the tasks which are associated with great for clients because it is uh, it adds a level of uh, efficiency. But what you do to the apprenticeship model, some kind of bar. 
and therefore where will you produce uh, produce so we have this discussion all the time uh, in our form and today i know while i'm talking to a group of seven gcs but our biggest threat today is an ai enabled gc uh, what you will after five or ten years come to us with a draft that we will buy the same technology that we do probably buy a co-pilot or somebody you know that as well and you produce that draft and come and say mr shaw patila she said you know is this okay uh, can you give us uh, 10 minutes of your time and tell us if this whether this is okay or not and uh, uh, and that probably if you know it's okay or not okay and you just want our insurance policy of the fact that you can then you can tell your boss that you know this is shaw is saying this is okay now that's not a happy state so uh, applying uh, the Gupta model to us uh, and innovate to you because if we disappear, you are in a lot of trouble. Uh, you, you, how you are going to deal with uh, deal with a lot of these ambiguities that they are that they're shaping up. The, uh, AI, the ethics of AI is a very big issue uh, as well because and I think it's established in people like both Bill Gates and Elon Musk that are talking about it that uh, AI. According to Elon Musk, that this is an existential threat for for us. He, he has gone so far as to say that he kind of destroyed man, more like a transformers kind of uh, dystopian world. Uh, because it comes with biases, biases of the people who created it, and when things go wrong, who are you going to blame? Uh, are you going to blame the AI? Are you going to blame the owner of the AI? Are you going to blame the coder who created? AI, are you going to blame the user? Uh, are you going to blame the guy who asked for AI to be applied? And all those kind of uh, ethical and liability questions are at large. And public policy is struggling to deliver some ridiculous uh, uh, directive that was uh, issued by BT, I think about a week or uh, two weeks ago, on a, what they called the advisory uh, on the use of AI. <coughs> but we don't know what an advisory is. Is it a delegated legislation? Is it a press note? Does it have the force of law? Does it not have the force of law? The technology world has gone into it. Is it trying to understand what it is? And people like me have been kind of criticizing it, but we don't know what we are doing. Uh, data. Data and implications. That's implications. So, data, I think, as you know, has been uh, called as uh, uh, new oil. Uh, we are uh, we have 1.4 billion people who generate mountains of uh, mountains of data. Uh, it is one of our biggest assets. Uh, not surprising that the world of big tech is kind of fighting over it uh, in terms of rights to export it, rights to uh, to mine it, and from a nationalist point of view, we naturally say no. This is our data. This is our asset. We can't use it. I mean, we already had so many centuries of exploiting us and impoverishing us. I don't start our work. Uh, and that fight, I think, uh, will continue. Uh, and that was essentially at the core of, I'm taking names here, the fight between Reliance and a lot of the global players. So, all about, finally, it was about data, Yamara data. Linked with that is cybersecurity. Any CEO, one of the nightmares of a CEO is a cyber attack, uh, especially if you are in an uh, area of, uh, where you have a lot of other people's data. So once a new GDP law comes into force, uh, like GDPR, the consequences will be horrendous in terms of liability and reputation. So, uh, for all of those who haven't been touched by it uh, so far, uh, it's going to happen to each of our organizations. It has happened to many law firms already. Some of the biggest law firms in the world have had uh, cyber attacks. Uh, DLA FICO was a very famous public one where their whole system was down for a week because they had been attacked in one small audit department. Somebody clicked on something uh, in Germany and that affected their whole world. The DLA was shut. So it's the largest firm in the world in terms of that time. Every New York firm, because it has so much sensitive enemy data, a uh, hacker would love to know what's a uh, hacker would love to know what's on my system uh, because we have so many uh, you know, sensitive uh, data and information. So cyber security continues to be a challenge. 
and the uh, the tools in the hand of the attackers gets better and better uh, every day. The epicenter of it may be in China, which is the latest kind of updates where China is behind most hacking uh, in the world. China, Russia, one of those two, but of late it's more China. China, I know, love loss for us. So they love to have a uh, So looking at it again now from a business point of view, looking at the areas of uncertainty and ambiguity, cyber has to be the top of your, uh, of your list. Now coming to deal making, which is a mega deal. For all the reasons that I just mentioned and many more, uh, what we are dealing with is the unknown unknowns. The pandemic was an unknown unknown. I mean, people knew that there was a Spanish flu almost a hundred years ago and all of that. And what got exposed uh, when we started looking at contracts that in the force major clauses, uh, many of them didn't have a pandemic uh, provision and they started discovering, oh, we should have thought it. Now everybody had it. Uh, but that was like, you know, holding the staple after the so uh, they will all be there's already already prediction that there will be another another pandemic, not COVID, something else as well. So but now at least some of that we have been anticipating. So how can we even protect against I mean, there's a known knowns, known unknowns, and there'll be unknown unknowns. And in a VUCA world, the number of unknown unknowns are probably more than they have ever been. Cross border regulation. Especially on antitrust, um, the US is such a big part of our lives, and two of their regulators, uh, I think both former lawyers, unfortunately, uh, the SEC uh, and uh, the uh, competition, the DOJ and the competition authority, uh, are on fire. And I think it's probably more under the Biden administration. Uh, they are out to build. Uh, a legacy of uh, enforcement, uh, and they're they're kind of fearless, and they genuinely have independent <coughs> attitude. So it's uh, uh, they're on a uh, they're on a mission as well. Uh, the, the competition commission, Bina Khan and SEC, Gary Gensler are known and both have come from strong enforcement backgrounds. Uh, they don't take any prisoners, and unfortunately, what's happening is sitting in India is that it is inspiring our regulators. The competition authority is still not, uh, I think there's still a, a, a competition system is still a little mind. But uh, thinking of SEBI, certainly I'm sure that Gary Gensler is a role model for uh, uh And you can see that coming out from every week. They all want to leave legacies. Litigation and regulatory acts. Uh, we have we have a chaotic and unruly legal system. We have probably the highest barriers, uh, judicial barriers uh, in the world. But we also have within that because of I, I would think a liberal part of our judicial system, where public interest litigation is such a big part of it, at least in the last 25 30 years has become such a big part of all the public governance uh, to have the Supreme Court correct things that go wrong, but it introduces so much uncertainty, too cheap, gold stamp. Uh, we had uh, recently a uh, judge called Arun Mishra, he never knew when he went to his court as to what will happen. Uh, there was a sigh of relief in the profession when he retired. Because you never know when you enter his court as to in what state you survive that day. Uh, or policy action. Look at what's happening in the gaming industry. Coming from gaming, you know what has just kind of descended uh, on the gaming industry in the last. Uh, we have a number of clients who got tax demands of 20,000 crores and 30,000 crores. And these are existential, uh, where they were never envisaged. Uh, and I know I'm entering into the sensitive political territory on what's happened on electoral bonds. Uh, as well. So the scheme was there, it was made by law. And when you, when people, not on the good or bad of it, but when they did buy electoral bonds, they bought it on the assumption that it is legal. Cancel karna hai karlo, aage se karo. When you change everything, 
uh, retrospectively, what does it do in terms of people who have uh, subscribed to it? Same thing happened in Vodafone, you know, uh, in the which, uh, and we just kind of internationally recovering from the damage that it caused. And when we talk to a uh, lot of our international clients, the first thing that they say is, you know, wonderful place, great market, blah, 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 but you guys can do anything at any time. Uh, and we can't take it for granted that there is a certain element of predictability in terms of how your policy and uh, judicial system will work. And there is a grain of truth in that. Uh, again, on deal making, uh, the rise of governance conversations. More public markets oriented, but I think that philosophy has crept through in private markets as well. Uh, in the on the public markets, uh, combination of many things. Uh, proxy advisors is probably front of line, uh, where uh, we have uh, I think the last decade, decade and a half, we genuinely have uh, the emergence of public uh, proxy advisors as a kind of almost like a gatekeeper of governments, and they get listened to. Uh, I know one thing for sure, uh, the regulator, whether they open the newspaper or not, they certainly open the proxy advisor report and starts influencing their, their thinking. Uh, then social media. So uh, a spark gets lit by somebody, could be a proxy advisor, and then within 15 minutes it's all over the country on, on social media. Just because things like whether it's WhatsApp or LinkedIn or Twitter, uh, there is almost instant uh, dissemination of it and formation of it. It doesn't matter after three months of trial or investigation or whatever, you know, who wins or who loses. Damage is done instantly and you can't, you can't recover from it because the damage to reputation always remains. Unfortunately or fortunately, we still haven't yet got uh, class actions as a like US type class action where you could be sued for very large amounts of damage in a jury like trial. So that has not yet happened, I don't think they're that far away. Uh, but there is what we have seen is uh, a lot of litigations emerging between uh, investors slash funders and founders. What we're seeing now is non Baiju's, uh, potentially in ATM. Uh, and others is a uh, is a really an expression of investors asserting their governance expectations uh, from the new genres of uh, businesses that have come up uh, and who haven't adjusted to the cultural fact that the capital paper is essentially new. So we have so many varieties of companies. There's the old fashion promoter led uh, world. Uh, Tata Pendance types, uh, where you have a high promoter of 30, 40, 50 percent, and you have public investors and institutional investors. Fair enough. At least there is enough skin in the game, and because of that, there is an alignment of interest and the government Mota Mota is. So you now have this new genre of where a uh, founder, uh, who is usually a very bright individual, has come up with an innovative idea. So he's probably in his late 20s or his 30s, etc. So holding not more than you know eight, nine, ten percent of uh, of the equity, the rest is all owned by it. and all of whom kind of uh, bought into the idea of uh, of this young entrepreneur, but forgot to ask the government's question uh, in terms of how are you managing uh, how managing your, uh, your business, and when you see that amount of money available. To people who have not yet fully matured as uh, responsible entrepreneurs, and they go mad, and then you end up with the kind of Bharat or uh, another one. And this phenomenon and the kind of uncertainty that creates in the business environment, the impact of it has been what funding has dried up, and it is affecting a lot of other people, even the so-called good guys. Uh, the cap is switched off, and now that whole sector of, uh, of corporate India is being reinvested. Another area of uh, uncertainty, as we are seeing it, looking at from a big picture point of view, succession. All the kind of old-fashioned, uh, the old-world businesses go by different terms: engine one, promoter, whatever it is. Uh, almost each one of them are going through intergenerational succession, and it comes with 
a lot of new attitudes, aspirations. Most of the next generation, second or third generation is US or UK educated. They see the Western world. They come with different mindsets uh, as well. They are not interested in having business necessarily. Uh, and because they, they feel kind of too overwhelmed by it, would like to do different things as well. And they start developing businesses on the sometimes adjacent business, sometimes completely unconnected. And when I'm assuming you are a part of the universe that is dealing with them and trying to do strike a deal with them, it's not like striking a deal with the old uh, promoter at all. Uh, this is a completely different ball game where you have to you actually need a new playbook. Uh, to work with uh, this new genre of, uh, in terms of how they look at relationships, how they look at uh, uh, their businesses. The older, older, older version probably thought of businesses as multi generational, you know, 50 years, 100 years. This is quick and fast 10, 15 years, build it, bring in your investors, sell it, get out, start the next year. Serial entrepreneur. So your horizon of the counterparty that you are dealing with is 10, 15 years at the most. Another imponderable is, uh, I think, the rise of millennials and Gen Z. Uh, their attitudes and aspirations. And I am sure there are lots of them here. I am mentally a millennial. Uh, <laughs> aspirations and uh, attitudes completely different. And for talent centric business, businesses, like say for example, an IT or consumer tech, where you're essentially dealing with that uh, generation, uh, it is hugely impactful as to what uh, what the young generation is doing and what are their considering. Nobody quite cracked it, but uh, it's very different. For example, an ESG consideration would be a huge factor for firstly whether talent wants to join you and how they see you as position in the uh, ESG world. There was a PwC survey that was done a couple of years ago on the talent market and one of the conclusions that they came up with was that one of the biggest talent appeals is where you stand on uh, the environment, uh, environment issues. Should I come and work for an organization? What's happened socially, I think, over uh, in the last sort of two decades is uh, because of the way policy has developed is that Consumption is the new, is a new. The whole world is, the first thing starts with that in order, you know, what you learn from your parents is that you know, engineer, one or doctor, one or year, one or, as well, for which you need a good degree and maybe a postgraduate degree as well. After you do that, that is your ticket to success. Uh, if you get a good job, maybe you can start a startup and you start getting rich. When you start getting rich, what is then everybody, there are lots of people in this generation who have achieved that. Then how do you show yourself and how do you sort of feed your ego? Start consuming. When you want your Louis Vuitton and you want your expensive watch and you want the car as well. So <coughs> measure of personal success is now becoming healthy consumption. And that kind of has created a kind of a new, which is part of the millennial <coughs> problem is that your interpersonal relations, your sense of self-worth, uh, and, uh, uh, and so we, I know how many of you have seen the movie Barbie, the new one. I think it's one of the most brilliant movies ever made, and, uh, which kind of puts a focus on one of the, it talks of patriarchy, it also talks of how the new generation has, um, has evolved, uh, and how it is, and how consumption has kind of taken over, uh, our lives and our sense of uh, self worth as well. And in this paradigm, how do you deal with that? I struggle with it every day. I have a firm which has got 90% millennials, I think. Most of whom are women also, but that's a different. <laughs> <laughs> but there, yeah, it's because we are, we are very, very gender diverse. And I think that's the good part. But uh, when you have a, a professional organization which is 90% uh, Gen Z and Millennials, the whole playbook is out. Uh, it's, uh, it's a completely different call game. And the only way to deal with it is to think like, which is why I call myself a Millennial. Uh, nations and societies are moving from, and India is a classic example of a relationship <coughs> to a rule based system. So, post independence, Nehru, Indira Gandhi, that time, what mattered was who 
सरकार में किसको जानते हैं वॉन्ट अ लाइसेंस मिलेगा ये मिलेगा वो मिलेगा एंड दैट्स हाउ इन वे टाटा बिरला ऑल ऑफ दैट जनरेशन ऑफ बिजनेस फॉर क्रिएटेड बिकॉज दे वर एबल टू नेगोशिएट टू द पावर सिस्टम इन दिल्ली What has happened, and I think Modi was the cutting the the turning point for that. We didn't make any use of any change. I let me make it all transparent. I am not going. You know, me come here, me thane dunga bhi nahi. All rule based technology, baseless assessment, blah blah. Good. I think it's a develop how a society develops. So what had that happened is that you know, a lot of people were stuck in the old way of doing things, and very often. <coughs> That you know your relationships, you think you have them, but when the chips are down, nobody needs you. You are on your own. And, and people come to us and say, "I will talk to you, I will talk to you." Either you talk to someone, there is no benefit. Either you are clean or you are not clean, or you are in the law. Okay, if you want to fight, we we'll fight for you. We'll defend your honor. I can't talk to you because it's pointless. And that guy on the other side doesn't also want to talk because he is worried what will happen to him tomorrow if there is a serious civil trial or something. You have in the read of things like the coal scam, where the coal secretary got case called in 15 years later, and for something he probably doesn't even remember. How do you deal with that paradigm? And that has deeply affected the psyche of the policymakers. So in this moving from relationship to rule based, the policy making paradigm has changed completely. Uh, also dealing with ambiguity, and I think we are work in progress because. When you are moving from a relationship based to a rule based, the least that you expect is the rules are clear. But we are working in an environment where the rules are not clear. We are drafting is probably the worst in the world. Uh, where you don't know what each word means. Then your next reaction is, "Puch kya? Puch ko jaake puchho ki iska matlab kya hai?" Typical reaction you will get is, "Apad lo." You will get a reaction. So when you come to somebody like me, iska matlab kya hai? So then I will tell you that this means that I think it is, but I can't tell you for sure because who will say it? I don't know. So in this, you go on spinning around um, and dealing with this new new paradigm. Uh, I think there are still work in progress between moving from relationship to to a rule-based society. And I think there are still work in progress between moving from relationship to to a rule-based society and a policy environment. Is there is it classically feeds into the rule class. It's volatile. It's uncertain. It's ambiguous. And documents. Uh, another paradigm that we are seeing is uh, boards are coming to life. Part of that governance thing. Uh, the old joke used to be that boards used to be basically the management, and what were then called the cashier directors. The only time they opened their mouth was the proper cashier. That has changed dramatically. In the independent directors now are a real force because, and they still. Making up, but uh, they, the the independent directors, many of them are putting their personal reputation on the line by joining public companies and are evolving into the new gatekeepers of companies. And which is why, when their understanding is incomplete, they can be seen as roadblocks. It's very hard to to you know, very hard to get uh, like the individual deals to your board. They will appoint sometimes a separate lawyer. They will take the government's opinion, ask for more extra valuation report, which is like a fairness report. All this for ten years ago was completely unheard of. You didn't even work at this. You know, management thinks it's a good idea, just do it. Then they cut it. You know, that was the general approach. Not anymore at all. The, I think the boards are, have come to life, and they will get more and more uh, assertive, very U.S. style. That's one of the kind of learnings of how governance practices has moved. As a cognate aspect of that is, as the professions are coming to life. So I had to get a certificate from a big four just now. Uh, at, there was a point of time they would sign their own death certificate also, but today <coughs> it's impossible to get even any opinion out of them because they're afraid of what NFR will do to them. What will be what will be the SFR will come in the future and Whatever happened in Satya, my friends, uh, everybody changed their manual. So, professional, uh, the world of professions has changed. From even law firms who would have otherwise, you know, 
the we were trained in terms of find a solution and we in the post independence time it was we knew that kuch bhi hoga finally jugad karke theek kar lenge you know we fix it that doesn't work anymore and therefore the professions are now in a new era of where uh, we are afraid of their impact of their advice on reputations and their professional standards one thing which we know I and mean, every major law firm has experienced it is that when there is an investigation on a deal the cops have no hesitation in a coming to your office secondly calling you uh, we had partners who been called to cbi and uh ed and god knows what we, nothing happens but they say hey, explain karo ki aapne ye structure kya hai ye kyun aapne advise kiya proof bata show me your email or in a public market which today uh, if you are involved with the banker is the obvious your banker what is an advice is guaranteed that as soon as the deal finishes all the people who were involved will get a letter from sebi saying who are the involved pan number kya hai aadhar card ki zara show us how the deal started from day one uh, till now from the beginning and this was unheard of and it got me i think crosses a lot of minds but that that is what it is today How is geopolitics entering deal making? Uh, I gave you the best not the example. Uh, ability and uh, any of the West or if we global investors haven't fully understood the fact that something has changed, and they're still quite distrustful of Indian Indian partners. So you should actually ask them. I have had a dinner together, and one of the uh, Clients represented in such a way just about coming to terms with again reinvesting in India because our memory 15-20 years ago was that we fell out with our partner and he set the whole police system against us. Uh, got our independent director, uh, uh, you know, arrested. Criminal prosecution start. We are up. We are trick. It's not happening. But my bosses who are sitting wherever they are, the last thought they have about India is that. ये ऐसा हो सकता है सो हाउ हाउ डू दे हाउ डू वी कन्विंस ग्लोबल पार्टनर्स अबाउट इंडियन सिस्टम एट वन लेवल बिकम हार्शर इज लेस केपेबल ऑफ बींग यूज टू सेटल पर्सनल स्कोर्स एवरी इंडिपेंडेंट डायरेक्टर मोर कंपनी इंक्लूडिंग माई सर भी फेस सिचुएशन में सम फालतू कंपनी विल गो इन सम रैंडम पुलिस कोर्ट इन सम गॉड फॉर सेकन सिटी इन इंडिया file some complaint write the local police and get some warrant to issue so to get a settlement <coughs> that has happened in india still happens but on a much less scale than before um, <coughs> nationalism linked with that is the idea of how uh, national politics can be used so this is years ago of course uh, maybe two decades ago When Singapore Airlines wanted to enter India, and Narendra Modi said nothing of the kind, and he completely had manipulated the system to make sure that Singapore Airlines. Now, finally, they came with Tata and all of that people. But uh, how the local politics could have been, can, and was manipulated to keep uh, foreigners out. We saw some versions of that playing out in Britain, where a very big player was able to. Uh, dominate the system. Uh, I think another problem that I'm seeing in the West is they are still coming to terms with the rise of India. Uh, their, their traditional notion of West has all the brain, West has all the money, and the East, of which India is a part of it, uh, is that country that you have to constantly keep lecturing to, uh, and kind of they. They want something here, which kind of help them and so on. But the fact that India is now a very different country in terms of its global influence, it's hard for some parts of the West. What did we see in the Canada situation was essentially, uh, which was uh, the West of which Canada, Canada was actually, in my view, it was reflecting U.S. politics. Uh, the fact that I mean, U.S. was very tricky. But on one hand, they get the Trump, Trump. Modi, great uh, Biden, red carpet, all of that is fine. But deep down, they are afraid that India can become another China, and one day they will say, "You know, get us. We are in. That can happen." 
deep down the, the uncertainty and insecurity is that how are we going to deal with this rising power which is growing uh, exponentially uh, every day. And then you have this Canada, the full Canada incident was nothing but that. Actually, this was without offending anybody. Uh, that incident could have been handled in a very different way. To blow it up where the Prime Minister of a country goes to their parliament and talks about something which without any proof as well, it, I think it's an expression of uh, insecurity about the country uh, more than anything. Nobody said anything when Mossad goes and shoots whoever they want uh, across the world. Why do they talk about, you know, about India rise? Why are we are bringing the Israeli and the Mossad model is basically built on you know, political uh, assassination across the world, and that's great because you know it's such an enemy higher than for our security. But why does it become a problem when India does it? Because we've not said unambiguously that we are part of the West. We say that we are we will preserve our own interests. <coughs> Enforcement trends, three or four. Things to stand out. The rise and rise of PNLA, which has probably become the most clear statute because the predicate offense under it can be anything, almost. And the Supreme Court has, the Pandal Court judgment uh, has kind of completely weaponized it. So if you are on the good side of government, something there. Otherwise, that can be a lethal weapon. Add to that the fact that legal privilege is uh, all but missing. Uh, you have very little to fall back on, except you can always go to your favorite lawyers, but short of that, there's nothing else. And the rise and rise of the regulatory state, what we're seeing just now, for example, in NDFC, since the RBI said it's coming back on the whole sector, what happened six months ago was on gaming. The whole system came after the gaming, uh, gaming sector because it was associated with, you know, it's like our mindset is still on tobacco. Tobacco is back. Attack it. Every budget would have something on tobacco with the tax cutter. Then there is in somewhere in somebody's mind in Delhi is a list of sinful things, one of which is gain. And I'm sure there are a lot of others as well. So when the system gets after you, then all the regulators fall in. Fall in. Just now it is NDS. The whole system is going after it in a, uh, in a methodical way. Why? Because they think that there is a bubble. There are valid policy considerations in their mind. They are not attributing bad faith to them. And giving them credit for the way they coordinate, uh, and that's why I'm calling it the rise of the regulatory state. There is RBI, there is SEBI, there is IRB, there is so and so and so on. So if you look at it in a simplistic way, they all separate regulators. When you look upon it as a regulatory state, these are just different faces of the same question. We are getting three new criminal laws, which have been passed in Parliament and will be brought into force on 1st of July. So now there is no ambiguity about Aniwala, Niyagi, so we effective date party. Uh, it's one mistake one can make is that it is basically the Indian Penal Code and CRPC with some lipstick for me. It's not. Uh, we call it Indianization, probably the only Indianization element I saw was the title English Major Hindi Kandira, but that's one part of it. So there's a lot of stuff under it. Firstly, there's big doses of technology. Technology has kind of been incorporated in the whole. So somebody can file an FIR sitting in some remote village in VR and you know you can bring any as opposed to the whole physical concept of criminal where you have to go somewhere and file a complaint and somebody will listen to you and write down your book. You can do it on electronic. So there's huge technology element. But the more pernicious side of it as I saw was some new definitions that have been or new uh, offenses that have been created. One of which is something called organized crime. When you think of organized crime, you think of Don Collier and Godfather, you think of some, you know, uh, Somebody sitting on the other side of the border, organizing some terrorist attack and other that. That's the sort of mental image that we have. But if the definition in this current form goes through, even a Harshad Mehta or even Naresh Goel or anybody just now who has some FIR, or more, more than one, the, the, the trigger condition is two FIRs should be pending. Then they can, if two FIRs for something which carries an offense of more than three years punishment, 
the two FIRs are filed and they can aggregate them and say ok now we have figured something called organized crime and I am now going to try you for organized uh, as an organized crime offender and then you are like a terrorist which you probably never recover because of the, the way the risk will come and I don't think India you can realize what this has happened. There are many more viewers like this but this one really struck me in terms of why is the state becoming so harsh and why are they not able to distinguish between run of the mill bread and butter criminal offences, there is such a thing, and uh, the almost existential type of uh, approach towards criminal law that is, is coming through. So, they could be, for example, uh, bank, no, bank fraud. Bank fraud is bank fraud, cheating, criminal breach of trust. Right? Okay, but organized crime is a different <coughs> ball game altogether. And you will not get a home with a travel anywhere, you are gone for life. And our uh, businessmen, when you are home, will be sort of sitting comfortably with somebody else's problem, and they never apply to more than I an organized criminal. I am not a terrorist. By the way, the definition of terrorist has been expanded to include economic terrorism. You commit a financial crime, you are also an economic uh, uh, criminal. Economic terror is actually. So that's the other thing which is developed in terms of enforcement trends. And it's again recognizing uh, the state. The, the latest one which I heard, this was I heard day before I was meeting with, uh, I was having coffee at the Sarsari Hotel, with somebody who was got a very senior position in enforcement. And I said, election ke baad kya hoga? So one of the biggest things that is going to happen. And the proposal is already there, we are just waiting for when the government comes back to business. If all the regulators and enforcement is going to be consolidated into one regulator, ED, SFI, or DRI will function under one label. Why? Because today what happens is suppose uh, the ED comes and raises you, they take all your documents and go away. The second guy who comes is a khali hai, sab kush nahi hai. So it's all gone. Now I have to go and talk to the other regulator, take the quarter. All that will go. There will be one master enforcer who will have three departments to it. And there will be like one super regulator or super enforcer. And this is going to happen. They said we are working on it. To do away with all the missing gaps between one regulator and the other. So post June, July or sometime in the year, I'm expecting a very different paradigm on enforcement. I think CBI will still remain uh, different because they are constituted under a different law. But uh, all corporate offenses, taxes, all of that will be brought under one umbrella. This is, uh, I believe, Ajit Doha's idea. He thinks like a cop, so he has got like a super cop. So this is what is cooking. This is part of VUCA. So, culturally, what is the effect of all of this? Culturally, in the last 75 years, we have moved from a business culture of forgiveness to now permission. It's like, it was what was earlier is to so long you are not a bad person, you are bad, you are sorry for me, kick, sort of fine line for me. Well, now you have to you, you face a doubt, you better go and take permission. As well, and again in that environment where uh, getting permission itself is a challenge. Second, I would say in terms of as you think of not just doing a deal, but in terms of how we conduct business, don't hit the ball on the line, hit it well within the line. If you hit it on the line, in the hope that every time I hit it, it will fall on the line, there will be one occasion where it will not fall on the line as you go over the line, and that there is. It is not going to be easy after. Now, while this may sound a little counterintuitive, after everything that I have just said, I still think India is the best place on the planet <laughs> to do business and to and to invest. There is no greater opportunity. I think. And from being told it's India's decade to India's century or whatever, and I think all of that is true. But it's an India that is changing very rapidly. Uh, economically, we are moving to become a developed and an advanced economy, and I think this is coming as part of that package. 
it is not possible to think of ourselves as a developed economy or as advanced economy without going through this kind of pivot of uh, our system. We will, I personally believe that we will not take the Western route uh, in terms of how we modernize our legal and policy system. We will, have, we will take parts of the Western model that we like and we will add our own tarka to it to make it into a very Indian recipe of how should India be governed from uh, and what should be the rules of business whether it's how we dealt with the data protection and how we are now dealing with competition law, how we dealt with our company law when we were in 2013 on the changes that we made. None of them are following the Western pattern. It's a, it's a, it's a very modified rule book. And so one of the things that has happened in India has from becoming a rule taker, we have become rule makers. Uh, as well. We don't take anything from the rest for granted. G20 also proved that. Uh, what we did also on you know, many of the announcements which were made in the so called Delhi Declaration and brought that into our own version of the rule book. So, continuing with the thesis that this is still the best place to be, this is the biggest, biggest market where you will make money long term. It is a democracy, it has a rule of law, but you won't function out of the whole thing. Uh, and don't think that changes are going to be linear. I think the changes are going to be very diagonal in terms of what policy uh, changes will come. It continues to be a very, very interesting place, both from a business as well as from a professional point of view. And the fact that it continues to remain uh, so fluid is what makes legal practice also so interesting. As well, no two days are alike. No morning and evening we were like. We know that on a, on, a, on a daily basis. So we are, uh, India is Bhukta on steroids. Uh, and I think with that I will stop here and we will move to uh, the panel, uh, which will explore. I think I think I have put out the problem statement. In the two panels, they are going to give you the solutions in terms of how to, how to do it. So with that, thank you so much. Okay.